The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister John Dale. Our study today in the series, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus, as we continue our study of the parables of Christ, this one is entitled, Counting the Cost, the parable of the tower and the parable of the king, and I'll be reading today from Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25 and going through verse 33, and I'm reading from the New King James translation. And great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. The two stories, not actually usually considered parables, but they are comparison stories, and that's what a parable is, have to do with the tower, and and all of us who aren't builders would have enough knowledge to know what this means, And that is, if you're going to build a guard tower at your vineyard, which is probably the picture that Jesus is drawing, or if you're going to build anything, you would first decide if you're going to have enough materials to get the job done. You don't want to build half a tower. Can you think of anything more useless than half a tower? And so Jesus gives them something to think about that they already understand. If you're going to build a tower, Get your materials together so that you can actually finish it and it will be a tower rather than just a foundation with a few blocks on it. And then the second example he gives is of going to make war against the enemy. Do you have enough weapons? Do you have enough soldiers? Do you have a a military strategy that will work? You don't want to go and start something that you can't stop. You don't ever want to do that. Also, you might even want to discuss with a delegation terms of peace so that there won't be any war at all because it doesn't look like you could be successful if you waged one. And so the people who heard Jesus understood what he was saying, at least in principle. But the context in which he said it will help us, I think, to put together the whole story and make a lesson out of this that we can use even if we don't know much about building or much about military things. We can find some valuable lessons in this for us. By way of introduction, great multitudes have been following Jesus and some thought that as the Messiah he would drive out the Romans. Others were fascinated by his strange teachings and his mighty works and others were just curious. He always had some kind of following. And in the context of Luke chapter 14, you find a multitude who's with him. Later, you'll find more multitudes. Earlier, you had found other multitudes. But the words seemed to be, in the minds of many of the people, that he was going to set up some kind of an earthly kingdom that would overthrow the Roman domination of the Jews. Now, they were very much in favor of that. In fact, if you go to Mark chapter 6, you're going to read where Jesus fed the the, uh, 5,000 men. And when he got through feeding them, he told his disciples to get into the boat. And the people in the crowd didn't get it, and the disciples didn't even get it. And he goes to a mountain to pray, 
and he says in so many words, Father, I've been with them two years and they still don't get it. They don't seem to grasp the fact that I have not come to set up an earthly kingdom to overthrow Romans. I have come to set up a spiritual kingdom to overthrow Satan and they don't get it. Anytime you try to teach something and the people don't get it, you wonder if you're doing a good job of teaching or if the people are just not on, their, on the right wavelength. Someone gave a comparison that Jesus was speaking on the FM frequency and the disciples only had AM radios. They just weren't getting the message. They were hearing him, but they didn't grasp it. He would straighten it out and they still didn't grasp it. He even came to the time of his ascension and just before, this is in Acts chapter 1, just before his ascension, they ask him again, Lord, will you at this time re restore the kingdom to Israel? And do you realize that there are people today who still don't get it? There are people who are still looking for Jesus to come to the physical country and the boundaries, the geographical boundaries of Israel to set up an earthly kingdom. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords right now in his spiritual kingdom. Mark 9, 1 says, Jesus speaking, some of you who stand by here shall not taste of death until you have seen the kingdom come with power. And none of those people are alive today. But many of them were alive in AD 33 at Pentecost when the kingdom prophecies were fulfilled in the establishment of the church. And then he could say to the Colossians, Paul could as he wrote to them, that God has translated you or transferred you out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. No, the crowd didn't get it. The multitude is following Jesus. Many of them think He's going to do something to overthrow the Roman domination. And others are just noting all these miracles. Here's somebody who's sick, and here's somebody who's lame, and here's somebody who's dead, and they're up and going. Now that is not just a sideshow, but if you're not a believer, you don't know what else to make of it. So there's a lot of curiosity among the people. He's doing some strange teaching by the world standards. He's performing some mighty works, and now, Jesus is making demands of the people and they're going to have to come out of that mindset into a spiritual mindset or they're not ever going to get it. And so we want to look at the requirements that Jesus offers. Notice verses 26 and 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Crowding along behind him did not mean discipleship. And Jesus makes this unmistakably clear to this crowd of people. And so he tells the two stories. Number one is the building of a tower. Number two is the going to war. And they could understand that. Hopefully they would make the transition so that they would see the meaning of the message. Let me say this as we, before we go into some study of the word hatred, because I think we really do need to see that clearly. Anytime a person is considering becoming a Christian, that person needs to take the time to count the cost. In other words, not to blindly rush into something that a month later you wish you hadn't done. Now, there's a balance in there somewhere, and I don't know exactly how to strike the balance for everybody's uh, approval, but I know that there have been people who are like the rocky ground that Jesus spoke of in the parables in uh, Matthew 13. The rocky ground is that great ledge of rock with a very small amount of shallow soil, and the seed, there's nothing wrong with the seed, and it is taken into that ground and it germinates quickly, but it doesn't have any root system. And so it quickly springs up, but it just as quickly dries up. The sun comes out and scorches and it doesn't bring forth any harvest at all. Jesus is there dealing with the superficial hearers, those who are not 
with any depth to have a root system so that they can be faithful and develop and grow. Here he's talking about the same thing. If you're going to become a follower of Christ, you need to know that there are some demands that the Lord makes of you. And as you come to see that, you ponder it and you seriously consider, do I want to do this? Is this the life I want to live? I love to make comparisons. Jesus didn't make this one, but I think we would understand this one too. Here's a couple who are dating and they're thinking about getting engaged and they'll be thinking about getting married. Do they need to enter into that lightly and blindly? No way. No way. As much as possible, they need to understand before the marriage ceremony what is expected of them afterwards. When I meet with couples who are going to get married, and I've met with some of you, and I'll be meeting with some more of you, and I'm thankful for that. But I'll give you a copy of a sheet, most times I do, give you a copy of a sheet that introduces a, a several sheets of material that we will look at and sometimes we'll study in detail if we need to. But that cover sheet will say, getting ready for the wedding and then in huge letters, and the marriage. The wedding is 20 minutes. The marriage is a lifetime. And so pondering, getting ready, counting the cost, helps balance out the idealism and the visions and all these things about what, how great it's going to be. I'm still saying marriage is great. Come September, Marsh and I will have been married 39 years. I still say it's great. Had to do all over again, I'd do it all over again. And if I had to choose whom to marry, I'd choose the same one. No doubt in my mind about that. But the point is, there is something to be said for counting the cost, getting ready to accept the responsibilities that come with the marriage commitment. Now, transfer that back to the spiritual side of becoming a Christian. You can't know at age 12 what all is expected of you. You can't know at age 21 as a uh, prospective husband what all is expected of you either. But you need to be able at least to figure out some of it and to understand the principle of commitment to the Lord first and to that mate and then to any children that might be born to that union and to continue to show respect to parents on both sides and quit telling stupid in-law jokes. And just go ahead and accept the responsibilities and then once the wedding ceremony is performed and it is official and legal and scriptural, then make the very, very best of living that commitment out every day with a proper understanding and application of the golden rule. And the golden rule, when applied properly and in a balanced way and understood properly, will make for a marriage that is successful. Understanding the commitment to the Lord means that not only am I gonna be baptized, that's easy. That takes less time than a wedding ceremony. But what it represents to be buried with Christ in baptism, the old man is dead and buried and put away and never to be resurrected, but the new man is raised in Christ to walk in newness of life, not in the oldness of death. That doesn't need to be taken lightly. It needs to have enough time to count the cost to make a mature commitment that you grow within and that you live out every day and every year as long as God lets you live. It is serious business. But on the other extreme, there are those who get engaged and they're so scared about the commitment of marriage, they never get married. One fellow I knew that was engaged for 29 years to the same woman. I think she gave up finally. 29 years of engagement. Now, there's something to be said for counting the cost, but there comes a point where it's not counting the cost anymore. It's called cold feet. Cold feet. Very cold feet at that point. So what do you do? Do you rush? No. Do you linger and linger and linger and linger? No. Somewhere there's the time to ponder, Count the cost, make the preparation, study as much as you can, and then if you choose to go through with it, make the very best of it and don't look back and say, oh, if I were single again. Uh, just don't say that. Don't think that. Make the best of it 
even with the human flaws and even sometimes with the mistreatment that you were not anticipating and even mistreatment that you were promised wouldn't happen, but it did. Counting the cost and becoming a follower of Christ. And so Jesus said, if you're going to come to me, you have to first hate husband, wife, son, daughter, mother, father, and even your own life also. If you just read that and leave it alone, you don't do any study of what the word hate means, you might come away accusing and charging the Lord with having said and taught something that he never taught. He taught the opposite. But we need to see what he said and then to see what he meant by what he said. First of all, the hatred that Jesus demands concerning Jesus' use of the term hate, the almost universal explanation is that he did not mean hate, but rather love less. This interpretation runs the risk of dulling the sharp edge of Jesus' command. What did Jesus mean when he said we must hate our fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters? I think if I were to ask for a show of hands out of 250 people in this room right now or more, uh, I dare say that most of us were taught that the word hate means to love less. That's kind of the universal way that it's been taught. And I'm not sure, but what that's the right answer. At least it's a possible answer. But again, if we take that to mean love less, we do run the possibility at least of dulling the edge of what Jesus said in this command. And so if Jesus said, if you come to me, you must love me more than you love your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter, or your mother, or your father, or your own life also. Well, that's true for sure. But let's see if that's necessarily the only view of the word hate. Number one, the whole spirit of Jesus' teachings made it impossible that his disciples understand these words in their most literal meaning. Nowhere would Jesus teach, I want you to literally hate your mother or your father or other family members. He spent too much time teaching people to love their family members. And when he said, love your neighbor as yourself, isn't it obvious that we're to learn to love ourselves properly? So Jesus isn't teaching against the teachings of Jesus. If it seems to be contradictory to his own teachings, we're the ones who missed it. So we have to understand the meaning of it. In Matthew 5 and Mark 7 and John 19, Jesus is saying, I want you to love. I want you to love. I want you to love. Love your families. Love your neighbor. Love even the right stranger. So he's teaching love, and he is also still teaching love in Luke chapter 14. Notice number two. The word hate is not to be taken to mean that we're to love our relatives and friends with a diminished love. Now this is the part where especially Everett Ferguson, who is uh, the author of one of the books where I got some of this material, he is saying that it doesn't mean a diminished love. It means a proper love. And if you compare it to the love you have for God, then it would seem to be a diminished love if we take the word hate to mean love less. And so in Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. 1 Peter 1.22 See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. So again, the Lord and the inspired writers of the New Testament are teaching us to love one another, not with a diminished love, but with a proper love. And so if you take the position that hate means to love less, then what you would be saying, is what I've been saying all along, is that you love the Lord the most. You love the Lord absolutely. Your confidence in the Lord is very real and personal and unshakable. And then you love everybody else properly, not improperly. And so husbands love your wives and wives love, wives love your husbands. And everybody wants to love the children. And who wouldn't want to love the grandchildren? And, but you don't love them more than you love the Lord. But according to Ferguson and others, that's not what the Lord is saying here. It's true, but it's not what this passage teaches. Notice what it does say. Number three, the words hate his own life also will supply the key to the problem. A disciple must hate whatever in himself and in others is low and base, all that is greedy and selfish. Whatever is self-indulgent and unclean is to be hated. 
And I think this is the key to the understanding of the passage. It means that you do love your husband, you do love your wife, you do love your other family members. You love them with all your heart. You dearly and deeply love them. And yes, you love Jesus more. But the point being made here is when Jesus used the word hate, he used the word hate. So anything that you see in your mother or your father or your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter or even in your own life also, which again is the key to understanding the passage, learn to hate the evil, that which is base, that which is degrading, that which is sinful. Learn to hate that. While you still love the person properly, you hate sin no matter where it's found or who does it. Now think with me of some application of that. Here's a young couple who get married and they have every reason to believe that life is going to be good. Both of them are Christians. They're walking in the way of the Lord. They love each other and they love the same Lord. They're active church members. They're doing the things that most everybody would think would build a foundation for a wonderful relationship. They have 2.4 children is the national average. I don't know how you, how you have 0.4 children, but you, you have a family, you have children. And maybe after so many years, you have grandchildren. Things just look to others that everything's going pretty normally and, and things are going well and you seem happy and you celebrate Christmas together and you have birthdays and Mother's Day and Father's Day and anniversaries and graduations and everything's just going really, really good. Not terribly unique, but very enjoyable and fulfilling. And then you find out that this husband of yours who was supposed to be gone on a business trip four days out of the week, had another family in another state. He had a wife and children and grandchildren over there. You say, well, that's a far-fetched example. Well, do you watch the news? 2020 had a clip a few months ago, a few, it's been years now, about a man who did exactly that. He was well known in both communities. He was home on weekends, th Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. He was with his family. And Monday through Thursday, he was with his other family. And neither knew it. For years and years, neither of them knew it. What are you going to do with that? Well, don't give out any answers right now. Just think about it. You're going to hate it. That's what you're going to do. You might be tempted to hate him. But don't hate him. Hate the wrong that is in his life. And hate the sin of which he's guilty. And don't ever say, oh, that's okay. He's so nice when he is here. Uh, I'll just be understanding. And when you start being understanding and supportive of things the Lord condemns, you've already got problems with the Lord now. Sin is still sin no matter who does it. And therefore, there must be opposition to sin, and that's where Jesus is using the term hatred. If I'm guilty of sin, you need to hate the sin. Please don't hate me, but hate the sin of which I'm guilty. If some member of your family, whom you love, whom you adore, is guilty of sin, learn to hate the sin and say so. But continue to love the person and try to bring that person to repentance. Try to salvage what's left of the feelings and the relationship. But when people lie and cheat, and you find it out, it has to hurt. It has to. But Jesus is saying, I want you to come to me, and if you want to come to me, you're going to have to hate evil wherever it's found, even if it's in your mother's life or your, your, your daddy's life, your son, your daughter, no matter who it is, you must learn to hate evil. And so he said, if anyone will come after me, 
Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Luke 14, 26, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate these human ties that have sin in them so much that you would hate the sin and salvage the tie. And as you come to do that, we see the challenge then that Jesus offers. Number one, am I willing to deny myself? Matthew 16, 24, I'm willing to give up self and selfishness because selfishness is sin. I need to hate sin in my life and in yours. And so I'm willing to go all the way, no half measures are going to do any good, to go all the way in hating sin and in denying self and selfishness. It doesn't mean all self-interest is gone. It just means that self is not in control. The Lord is in control. And I can learn to hate sin in my life as much as I hate it in the lives of others. Anybody who abuses children has a special place in my heart that I have to really work at not hating the person. I really have to work at it. But I hate that sin so much that I have to really, really try hard not to transfer my hatred for the sin into a hatred for the sinner. Do you realize that God hates sin, all sin, but he loves sinners, all sinners. And my Bible says all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. So am I willing to deny myself, that is to deny selfishness, sins that are mine, the sin that so easily besets me? Am I willing to try to break ties with that so that it no longer has its clutches over me, but I've traded the shackles of sin for servitude to the Lord? It's slavery either way, but the Lord is the master in control who will bless me here and hereafter. Satan on the other side is the one who will give me lots of allurements and gratifications here in this physical world which will finally lead me to be destroyed eternally. I need to hate Satan and sin every way possible and I deny self because sin in self is still sin. Number two, am I willing to abide by the teachings of Jesus? Jesus said in John chapter 8 verse 31, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. As you look in 1 John chapter 2, abide in him, and his word will abide in you. Remember the vine and the branches? John chapter 15, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He said, as long as the branch abides in the vine, it will have nourishment. It can be pruned and cared for, and it can produce fruit. But he said, you must abide in me. It can't be a passing fancy. It can't be a one-day-a-week thing. We look at the, the calendar, and we say, well, today's Sunday. This is the day that I get to go and do something for the Lord. I live six days for me and one for him. No, all seven of them are his. And so am I willing to abide in his teachings even when I'm not at the church building? Even when it's not Sunday, am I abiding and abiding and abiding and abiding in the teachings of Christ? And then number three, am I willing to follow him to the end? To the very end, am I willing to follow him? Mark chapter 13, verse 13 says, He who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Revelation 2, 10b says... Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee the crown of life. Now, in that particular story of the church in Smyrna, Jesus might have been saying through John, be faithful even if faced with death, if it leads to your death. And that may well be what it means. But it also implies being faithful until death, no matter how it comes. If it comes through persecution, martyrdom, or if it comes through old age, you just wore out one day and it's all over finally. Just be faithful anyway and keep on being faithful. We must forsake all, including self, and be totally devoted to him as long as he allows us to live. To understand that we're to be totally faithful 
for our total lives. Doesn't mean that we'll never make any mistakes. It simply means that our commitment will not change. I'm devoted to the Lord. I've decided to follow him. No turning back, no turning back, no matter what happens to me and no matter what others may do to me. Summarize and conclude by saying this. <clears throat> Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to come after me, if you're really going to be serious about this, count the cost. And he said, don't let your mother or your father or any other family member come between you and me. And so the love is first and foremost for the Lord who's in control. Everybody else figures in somewhere else. But it ha doesn't have to be a choice, really. The choice is Jesus is Lord, and that's how I interpret my life at home, and that's how I interpret my life at work. Everything is the Lord's. All 168 hours in the week are His, not just while I'm at home or while I'm at church or while I'm not at the ball game. It's all His, all of it. And so I count the cost. I ponder before I take this plunge. But I need to, having counted the cost, I need to take the plunge. I need to become and be a faithful child of God, a follower of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus said, as you count the cost, do you hate sin? Do you really hate sin? Are you willing to deny yourself? Are you willing to abide in my teachings? Are you willing to stay with it as long as you live? Don't start something and not finish it. That's what the tower builder did. That's not going to work. Get into it. Get into it fully. Be immersed in it literally and figuratively. And then go for it. And don't turn back no matter what. Be glad you did. And as you come to the close of your life, so you live to be 115 years old and you're pretty clear right up to the last. Guarantee you that you will not come to the close of your life regretting having lived for the Lord. It will not happen. Live for the Lord every day as long as God lets you live. This has been It Is Written, a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God with John Dale, minister of the Glendale Road Church of Christ. Please visit us online at glendaleroadchurch.org. Oh, let thee.